So uh, we're doing another special podcast. This one's going to be about the critical theory of religion, uh, or not quite just about the uh, critical theory of religion, but about Rudolf J. Siebert. It'll be an autobiographical podcast about his life, which is truly uh, amazing. And if you, if anybody's seen Forrest Gump, this guy has done way more than he ever did. So with that being said, I've got Rudy in the studio with me, and I've got my brother, Dustin John Bird, with me too. We call him DJB for short because he's just that cool but uh dustin he is a scholar so he's not used to those uh those uh cool names and, and initials so uh without any ado uh dustin it's good to have you here uh, it's your show take it all right well thank you for having me and uh i'm here with uh my mentor my doctor father uh, uh rudolph j siebert who i started to study with back in the beginning let's see of 1994 after i graduated uh, high school in South Haven and went to Western. Uh, so 94 was the first time I took a class with Dr. Siebert. And here we are uh, over 20 some years later and uh, I'm still working on, on critical theory of, of religion, helping develop it as it pertains to Islam, uh, the Muslim world, how it pertains to the New Radical Right, which is a book I'm working on right now. Uh, but today it's not about me, it's about uh, Dr. Siebert. So um, we want to talk about your biography today. And uh, since it's rich with experiences, uh, and all those experiences have helped inform the critical theory of religion, which we work on. So tell me a little bit about your, your early life, about uh, when and where you were born and your parents. And so I was born in 1927. That was two years before the Great Depression. My father was born two years later, and his life was always more difficult. And um, so I was born on the west side of Frankfurt, which was the working class uh, people. And the Frankfurt school people like Fromm and Adorno were all born on the east side, uh, the rich side of Frankfurt. So, so I was, uh, had this working class life. My father and my mother were working in a Jewish uh, factory, a shoe factory. And um, so I have these first political experience as a little guy when the uh, fascists on one side and the communists on the other side met underneath my window and were beating each other up. And then came the police and uh, on horses and beat both of them up. And then came the hospital people and uh, picked up the bodies. That happened every Saturday morning and it was tremendously exciting for me. I, I waited for it all week long. So, and then of course, it came 1933 when I was six years old. Uh, then uh, first Hitler came into power and then law and order was established. And uh, uh, the street in which I grew up was uh, not only a working class street, but it was also a street for widows and orphans. All the fathers had died in the war. So the whole street then turned fascist and the university, which was close by, turned fascist. So. That was this uh, tremendous, horrifying event where a um, large part of the nation were uh, fascinated by Hitler and his program and his authoritarianism and uh, things went very well then. 1934, Hitler was able to give six million people jobs, uh, which was 10% of the population. So um, there was great jubilation and uh, he was seen as a messiah. Uh, my parents voted still center party, uh, the Catholic party. The Catholic party gave Hitler the emergency laws, which made him legitimately into a dictator. And uh, then Hitler dissolved all these parties and uh, the whole parliament became fascist. And um, then of course the war came, the attacks on Poland and uh, the whole plan to uh, not to conquer England, but to conquer Russia and to kill communists. The communists had already been put into concentration camps and now Hitler marched with four million men into Russia and killed over 26 million uh, Russians on the way until he was stopped in Stalingrad and Kursk and uh, in Berlin. So that was the early time as far as the whole politics was concerned. I grew up as a Catholic, Roman Catholic. My mother had been a Lutheran and she converted to Catholicism. It took her five years to do so. So I grew up as a Catholic then. I was in the Catholic Youth Movement. There was a concordat between Hitler and the Vatican, according to which this youth movement could exist. But after two years, Hitler broke 
the Concorded and my leaders were beaten and tortured. We could not even open the coffins so badly they looked in the, when we had the funeral ceremonies. So, so there I saw a religion struggling with the modern society, with one version of it, not with liberalism, not with socialism, but with fascism. And um, that was deeply impressive. And out of this grew the motivation to have a critical theory of religion, which would be concerned with this antagonism between the sacred and the profane. Uh, in the Middle Ages, there was some harmony between the two. But modernity means that the two sides are struggling with each other. And we had a theory then which looked forward to a possible reconciliation of the two sides, which daily produces these uh, culture problems, culture battles and struggles, uh, like uh, divorce or abortion or birth control or whatever. There are innumerable of these problems which come up every day and are very disturbing for the public sphere of our society. One of the stories that you often tell to your students is the story of, of you on your way to the Lessing Gymnasium where you went to school. Um, and on your way there, you bumped into an old lady. Right. Uh, could you tell that story? Right. So in the Catholic youth movement where I grew up, there was no anti-Semitism whatsoever. So people, the priests in the parish said that what happened to the Jews in Frankfurt, that this was a horrible thing. So, of course, unfortunately, the Christian churches had a lot of anti-Semitism. Luther was very anti-Semitic, and so were his Catholic partners, and so on. So, but there was nothing of that in my Catholic education. So, the one morning, it was in 1941, uh, in spring, I went to this uh, elite high school, humanistic high school, the Lessing Gymnasium, and uh, I, uh, my bike, this chain fell off and I had to push it, so I was a little bit late anyway. And there I saw an old little lady before me, maybe 70, 80 years old, and she carried two heavy suitcases. And so as I came behind her, I thought maybe I can put the suitcases on my bike and uh, can help her a little bit. So when I came close to her, I saw that on the left side she had the yellow star uh, which showed that she was Jewish since the Nuremberg uh, laws. She had to wear that star, so she did not dare to talk to me, uh, and I was not supposed to talk to her, but uh, I thought, well, you know, she needs help. So I talked to her, and slowly she uh, also became more trusting, and in Frankfurt dialect, like every other uh, woman in Frankfurt, uh, she told me that the police had been in her house the day before and the night before and had told her to take all what she could carry and go into that Lessing Gymnasium, into the air shelter. And uh, from there she would be taken to Eastern Europe in a nice little village and you wouldn't have to suffer the bustle of this big city and uh, they would be, it would be a very harmonious uh, uh, life there. So, um, so, well, so after she had told me that, I put her stuff on my bike and we rode down to, to the Lessing Gymnasium and they were already murmuring down in the basement. There were already hundreds of Jews in that basement waiting for transportation into, uh, into the into Eastern, toward, toward Eastern Europe. But um, the most uh, tragic element in all of that is how much one does not know uh, when one does something like this. I thought I did a good thing, you know, as a Catholic boy to help the old lady and so on. But we met right before the IG Farben Industry uh, Center in Frankfurt, which is still standing there today. And IG Farben produced the Cyclone B, which, by which uh, the Jewish people and others, uh, gypsies and so on, were gassed in the camps. And uh, so it was invented by the uh, inventor of a gas war, Fritz Haber, uh, in 1915, uh, a Jewish person too, and so um, but we had no idea what was prepared in that building where we met. So um, she thought she would go to paradise in, in the eastern camps there, not uh, real paradise. So, but she had no idea of what would happen. And uh, Germans in general, my mother, working class woman, she thought uh, camps were there to teach people work. 
and work would make them free. So gypsies didn't work and uh, Jews didn't work and uh, um, so all these, the, the communists did not work and they were all lazy people and they had to be taught to, to, be, to work. And so these camps were cheap labor resources. They even got a little salary, 50 cents or whatever. They had canteens where they could even buy something in the camp. So it was a cheap labor resource and uh, there were forced labor outside of the camp and then there was forced labor inside of the camp. And it served the big corporations like IG Farm or Tussor Group. And, uh, so um, it was a business affair as well. And it, they were not to get death camps from the beginning. Uh, they became death camps and at the time of Pearl Harbor, when the uh, world war, when the European war became a world war, and Hitler had announced three times in Parliament that if the Jewish high finance, that means uh, uh, the uh, uh, bankers and so on, if they would once more uh, instigate a war among the European nations, a world war and so on, then beyond Europe even, then that would not be the end of Europe, but it would be the end of the Jewish race. And so while we have no signature of Hitler under the death camp uh, affairs and so on, it was all uh, Heidegger, uh, it was all uh, his underlings, but um, nevertheless it started at that time that the death camps far in the east, so far in the Russian territory, far east in Poland, that uh, these camps then became death camps very contradictory, but these people who were killed now could not be workers anymore. But things became very irrational. Trains which would have been used for the army were used in order to transport. Uh, it was all very much uh, illogical, non-logical, irrational, even in terms of Nazi thinking. Right. And you remember Kristallnacht, the yes. night of the broken glass. Right. So the Kristallnacht, I was uh, in, in a swimming pool in Frankfurt very close to a very famous synagogue where Martin Buber were and the great Jewish mystics. And uh, so I came out of the swimming pool and one has to look at one's consciousness so what one knows and what one doesn't know. So I came out and there was beside the swimming pool, there was this big synagogue was burning. And, um, and the strange thing was that the uh, engines, the fire engines were there, but they didn't extinguish the fire. The, the, the other uh, put water on the buildings on the right and the left in order to protect them, but they let the synagogue burn. So that was very strange, but uh, it would I would be uh, projecting things if I would say that I don't know exactly what was happening, but I was going to the main road in Frankfurt, the Seil, and all the Jewish stores, there were many of them, things flew out the windows there, and uh, that's where the name comes from, porcelain and lamps, and so that's why it's called the Crystal Night. And at that time, then, 30,000 Jews were put not into concentration camps, as I thought for some time, but they were put into normal prisons because a young Jew had killed a German diplomat in, uh, in Paris. <laughs> and uh, Goebbels took that <coughs> as a basis for his anti-Jewish campaign. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a few years ago, um, when we traveled to Frankfurt, uh, I had the opportunity to go to the Lessing Gymnasium, mm -hmm. um, your elite high school, that you went to, <coughs> and there was a picture on the wall of um, of the students uh, from this time, mm -hmm. this time period. And every so often, there was a student that was missing from the picture. Mm -hmm. And I remember asking uh, a friend of ours uh, what that meant, and she said that those were Jewish students that were mm -hmm. missing. Yeah. Now, do you do you remember that? Do you remember the Jewish students yeah, just I, missing? There was maybe one or two uh, students in uh, Jewish students in there. So um, I was a little proletarian, so there were not many working class students there. So in each class there was one working class student and we had a very hard time to um, get into the spirit of the middle classes. They were all traveling to the Nile River and I didn't even know where the Nile River was. And my parents talked about sausages and nice things to eat, but they didn't talk about the world. And so the same thing was true for the Jewish people, token people were taken in. So there was maybe one, two boys or girls in each uh, and they class and they disappeared slowly uh, without anybody saying anything. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we did not even know <coughs> if they had gone to another town or if they had been ill or 
nothing. It was just absolute silence, but they disappeared. Yeah. And you got in trouble one time with a Hitler Youth uh, yeah. commander. If I remember the story right, you, you yeah. told your younger brother Karl right. not to go yeah. visit them and to study Greek and Latin. Yeah. Instead. But first, you know, I would like to say something else about these classes and the Jewish people. Um, the class, they were, had a humanistic uh, uh, level and many of them, the students, were anti-Nazi from their background, from their parents. So, but uh, as we met later on, later years, our class cam comrades and so on, they were always amazed that I was so stubbornly uh, um, anti and so suspicious always of what was happening uh, because one of them had a father who was the conductor of the Frankfurt Orchestra and um, he was supposed to fire Jewish violinists or pianists and so on and to refuse to do so. So the parents were really actively resisting but the children they did not understand why their parents were in trouble. So. I think that my Catholic education and the humanistic education made me critical uh, uh, toward the Hitler Youth and uh, so. Mm -hmm. So, nevertheless, I had to join the Hitler Youth. It was a state youth, and every citizen had to be part of it. But um, so I didn't go most of the time, and so I wanted my brother. I told my brother Karl. I said, "You don't go to the Hitler Youth on Wednesday afternoon at three o'clock and marching around there to learn Latin and learn Greek and." Then Hebrew, and then later on you will be something. Well, he got angry. My father had died early from cancer, so I had to take care of him, but he didn't want to be taken care of. And so he went to the Hitler Youth leader and said, my brother, my brother didn't allow me to come, that's why I'm late. My brother said, you will not last very long, and I should, uh, he should uh, do his Latin, and so on. And so the uh, Gauleiter, the, the uh, head of the state of Hessen, then, uh, then took the money away from me, the school money, and it was all of the salary of my mother. So um, I had to leave the school because of that. But um, my mother, um, there were in Nazism, they did a lot for workers. So power through joy trips on the Rhine River on boats. So there was a boat trip and all the shoe factory was on the boat. And so my mother went to the... Uh, to the director of the corporation, who had taken over from the Jews, Schneider was the name, who had gone to London, and so the Nazis took over the factory. So my mother went to him and said, think what has happened, you know, the uh, governor took the money away, and now I cannot pay for it, you know, my salary is too low, and so on, and so on. And so he just stopped her and said, we'll pay for it. Mm -hmm. So you see that um, fascism is not so totalitarian as people think there are struggles under the surface between the economic groups, between the military groups, between the SS and the army and so on. But it is the charismatic leader who keeps it down and creates the element of unity. So, so for a few years then that factory paid my school money until I was drafted and uh, um, then uh, I didn't uh, then they gave it back to me, the school money, after I did heroic things. So they, uh, the state paid it again, but there, there was no school anymore. Right. <clears throat> so, um, it, about the age of 15, this is when the Air Force officer showed up uh, to your house and basically informed you that you had been enlisted into the Luftwaffe, into, right. the, into the German Air Force. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know you had said that the Catholic Youth Movement was already uh, greatly influential on you, right. especially Pastor Rudolphi, mm -hmm. right? which you've written a book about Pastor Rudolphi. Yeah. Can, can you tell us about him? Yeah, so he was the pastor of this uh, Santa Familia parish at the outskirts of Frankfurt now. Frankfurt had become Protestant already in, in 1525 or so. It was a totally Protestant country, but uh, city. But then uh, Catholics suddenly came back again and uh, restored parishes who had not been active for uh, 400 or 500 years. So, so nevertheless, he was uh, very energetic, very uh, dynamic, and um, he had been in the First World War and had been wounded there and uh, was formed by this uh, war experience, like Hitler was, like my father was, and so on. 
And so uh, I was very fascinated by him and during the war he became very prophetic. Uh, that means he applied uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Jesus and so on to the scene, to the historical situation. So another book was written about him and they painted him as a Nazi. I painted him as an as a, uh, anti-Nazi and so on. So the other one, there, he had put up the Nazi flag in 1933 as everybody had to do. And, and so from that he started and said he was a Nazi. And, but I had so much evidence that he, uh, whenever he gave a sermon, the Gestapo was in his church, usually ex-priests who uh, had become Gestapo officials and they would write everything down and the Gestapo brought him down. He was beaten up in the Gestapo basement and so on. So he suffered day after day. Uh, the, um, uh, youth movement, the Hitler Youth came into the church, took us, the altar boys, out, and so on. There was a lot of uh, problems there through 12 years. And then the um, interesting thing is uh, the um, uh, leader of the Nazi party in Frankfurt, in, in Ginheim, this suburb, mm -hmm. uh, who had done all these disturbances and so on, uh, came to Rudolfi and they had an hour long talk with each other and uh, somehow reconciled, or um, we don't know exactly what happened, but somehow uh, reconciled or forgiven uh, for all of this. But then came another event, the, um, uh, the, the day at the end, toward the end of the war, an American liberator bomber for engine uh, came over the church uh, after, at very low but uh, because he, it had been uh, damaged. And, uh, but the pilot, the pilot and the, the man could still jump out. And so one of them jumped into a little forest close by and he was wounded. And he was laying there in the, on the ground and uh, asked for a doctor, 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 and so on. And this fellow there, this Nazi leader, the Bauchspies was his name, uh, he went down there and took his revolver and shot him and said, here is your, uh, here's your doctor and so on. But Rudolfi was there to give him the last sacraments. It um, didn't matter if he was Protestant or Catholic or whatever, he was a Christian. And so he went there with his bike and went to the man. He could not rescue him anymore, but he gave him the last sacraments. And uh, so then when the American army came into Frankfurt, they right away looked for the criminal who had shot this pilot and uh, so they needed uh, now witnesses and they were communists who had survived but uh, the Americans did not trust the communists but there was these Christians and Rodolfi was one of them and they asked him to come in and to give witness against him and uh, so Rodolfi said that the, uh, it was under the seal of confession and the judge said, but he's a Protestant, so it, you see, it doesn't matter. But he said, no, it doesn't matter, Protestant or Catholic, everybody's baptized. It is under the seal of confession, and he could not witness against him. So they went to, to the communist anyway, who gave witness, and then he was sentenced to death and was hanged. And one of the chaplains of Rudolfi did then did the burial. He is buried in Frankfurt in the cemetery there. So um, these are some of these tragic things where Rodolfi would say, nobody will understand later on what happened here, you know. It is so unbelievably confusing that a high-level cultural nation with Mozart and Beethoven and Goethe and Schiller and so on could suddenly turn into such barbarism. Nobody had expected this, you know, but uh, Frankfurt School did predict it and they predicted also what we have now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So back to at, at, at 15, the Air Force officer comes to your door. You're already deeply skeptical of, of fascism, mm. of the Nazis, mm. of, of Hitler. Uh, but you're being told that you're going to be in the Air Force mm -hmm. and you're going to defend Frankfurt from the bombers. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and as you always say that, you know, at, at first, you know, the idea of doing this was not something that was very pleasing to you, obviously. Mm. You know, on principle, you were against this party and mm. the war goals. But at the same time, the defense of women and children mm -hmm. huddling in the basements of their houses as bombs, you know, the mm -hmm. saturation, saturation bombings mm -hmm. happening, is something that you felt you had to defend. You had to defend those women and children. Yeah. So what was it like going into, into the German Air Force? I mean, what were your experiences with that? 
Well, I mean, we also had uh, listened to uh, uh, British broadcasting secretly about death penalty. And uh, there was a Nazi in every house who watched everybody. And uh, we had one in the house and he listened and he said, Odie, you cannot do this. I have to uh, tell. And he never told. He never told. So, but, uh, so that we knew a little bit more than people knew around. So about what was coming in terms of bombers and so on. So, yeah, so I was in the... Um, uh, I shut down probably uh, uh, 18 bombers and and, uh, um, and so the question was how I would justify that uh, cooperation and so what happened on the day when I uh, was brought to the air, air, Sossenheim airport where I was trained uh, a city Frankfurt was bombed and so I saw people in the tower you know the burning the whole city with all wood house, wooden houses and and I then, in my own conscience, I said, okay, this I can, I'm not for these guys, but I'm for those people there who are killed. And if I can distract, you know, there came 500 bombers, 1,000 bombers in an attack. Um, if I can distract some of them and they throw their bombs into the Taunus Mountains instead of into the west side of Frankfurt or so, um, then this would be a good thing. So with this, um, I did this with... Uh, a good conscience, and I discussed that also with uh, Senator McGovern, who had done the bombing, and uh, and we both were aware, you know, that on Judgment Day we will have to stand up for whatever we are doing. He thought he did the right thing. He thought that that bombing would help to uh, remove the Nazis, you know. And um, I was more concerned with the people who had to suffer under all of this, and I also had doubt if. Uh, if the um, bombing, the saturation bombing, really was helpful, because in a certain way, it brought people together. Uh, it made it even it made them into more believers into the Hitler cause than they were before. So uh, um, that is, uh, you know, that is why why I had doubts about the whole mission and the uh, while the uh, attack on the Normandy, Eisenhower commanded sixty thousand men. But in the struggle of Moscow, 10 million men were involved. So it, the Nazi regime was killed off in the huge areas of Russia. The Apollo's army was one million, one army alone, one million. And uh, maybe a few thousand came back in the end of the in General 15 Paulus years. Was, General Paulus was converted. In he converted, yeah, he surrendered in a in a store somewhere in, in Stalingrad, and Hitler thought he should, he had made him into a marshal just a few months before, he thought he should have uh, killed himself uh, instead of going to Moscow and being put into cages and marched to Moscow. So they were not put into cages, but they had to march to Moscow, and it was a very shameful thing, but he converted and became a socialist, and he died in East Germany in the 50s. So. Um, he was that what the Germans then call a traitor, uh, like uh, the assassins. So that um, you know that was a very complicated situation, and uh, and as I said, we with McGovern we remained close friends, and um, because it's so hard to decide those questions, you know, mm -hmm. we both agreed that fascism is an evil thing, and we've both fought against it, but on the other hand, I tried to protect those women and children because there were no men anymore. The men were all at the Eastern Front, right. you know, or the Western Front, and uh, so all that was there were old men and women and children. And right. This so, is the beginning of the Volkssturm towards the end of yeah, the Yeah, right. So these were old men and young men and so on, yeah. And I saw them hanging, you know, from the trees if they did not function well and did not obey. Mm -hmm. Um, so these were very, very complicated times, and so McGovern and I, we thought that on Judgment Day we would have to get our final judgment. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then after you got out of the Air Force because of the, because of, as you say, that there's no more planes right. left, or very few planes yeah. uh, flying, you were put into the Wehrmacht, right. so the, into the German Wehrmacht and the right. German Army. Um, where did you go with that? Where did you fight? So. Um, I found, we found uh, um, a work about the Battle of Aschaffenburg mm -hmm. and, uh, by an American colonel, and he did a very good job. He took to 
German resources and uh, American resources and Canadian ones and reconstructed the whole battle and I learned from that be, uh, a lot because when you are in the battle itself, I was a lieutenant, uh, it's a very small area which you look uh, over and so I had no idea, for instance, that uh, the Battle of the Hanenkamp, which was reported everywhere uh, against uh, Patton, that uh, uh, that this battle was part of, uh, that this mountain was part of a whole mountain range. So you have this little tunnel vision. I did not know that the bunker system, uh, which I saw there, was part of a second western, uh, like the Siegfried line. So Patton had spoken through the first one, but there was a second one. But I was not the only one, but American soldiers too, because when they crossed the line, they were told, you know, everything is okay now, you will not find any resistance. And then suddenly they came to Aschaffenburg and to Alzenau and found fierce resistance, and that was the book about it. How can suddenly, when the whole army is already beaten, you find such horrible resistance? And they were very upset, the soldiers, and the morale went to a deep level because they had expected all would be easy now, and then suddenly it became very, very tense and mm -hmm. a lot of casualties and so on. Yeah. About the planes, you know, I said there were no planes, but the officer who wrote the book said there were planes, but I could never call any planes in, you know, against American tanks. So there, there was an attack where I faced 80 American tanks, and one usually would call the Air Force in. But there was no Air Force, but there was these new planes where there, there were rocket planes which could only stay in the air 20 minutes, but they flew over the American lines and machine gunned the tanks and so on. But um, I never had any, any access to them, so, but they were around. So, mm -hmm. so very late, I mean 50, 60, 70 years later, you suddenly discover things of which you had no idea when you had to make all these decisions, you know. You have to make all these small decisions in a situation which you are not knowing very well. Right, right. If I remember correctly, there was an episode where um, an officer assumed you had deserted yeah. because you were off doing something. Right. So there was the Battle of the Hanenkamp, and uh, I gave the orders to, um, to my group, the 250 that men, uh, to withdraw and uh, it was already late in the afternoon, Sunday after sun, uh, Easter Sunday, 1945. And um, to go as fast as possible, you know, to call or jump or whatever to, these, uh, to the forests where the tanks could not follow. And then the American army stopped fighting at 5 o'clock. So they fought from 8 to 5. And they, at 5 o'clock they put all the guns on automatic and uh, so then they would not follow. But they were so demoralized that they just marched slowly as well, like a Sunday afternoon trip with the family, you know, walked slowly up to the forest and were all taken out by machine guns from the tanks. And, mm. and the tanks could break in because the Hungarians who were fascists too, all of Europe was fascist, so we had a few hundred uh, officers, Hungarian officers, and they deserted in the morning at four o'clock and uh, we didn't notice it. And uh, the, uh, so the, the tanks could break in. So. That was the last battle, and at the end of this battle then, I had two of my soldiers who were still alive but wounded and they wanted to have a priest. And so, since I thought, you know, five o'clock, nobody fights anymore, so I went to the next village, the next valley, and um, uh, I left my weapons back except the revolver, and so um, then I met an old pastor and I poured him up and uh, two, and he gave the two the last sacrament, and. Uh, and uh, then they died during the night. But I wanted to bring the old man back because it got dark and he had big glasses and couldn't see anything. So, so I went back with him again without weapons except the uh, one thing. And uh, so there I suddenly uh, faced the SS with a motorcycle and a hangar and they went back and forth behind the lines and caught everybody and caught him a traitor and they were hanging already in the moonshine there the three old men and young men and so on. <laughs> so at the last moment, as they were already signing the papers, um, their, uh, my general from Bavaria, high school teacher from Bavaria, he came, you know, and saw the whole situation. It was very dangerous because SS didn't obey, you know, the army generals. So 
Um, but he had humor in this whole situation. He pulled the helmet down over my face. I was very thin at that time. And I disappeared in my helmet and he said, look at this. I mean, it's not worth a bullet, you know. And then we don't have many bullets anymore and then we don't have many men anymore either. And so, and by making his Bavarian jokes there, he was able to get me out of there. And so that was very lucky. So you weren't hung? Yeah, no, I wasn't okay. hung. No, right. <laughs> That's yeah. that's fortunate, right? That, that right. he was uh, providence. He was there, providence. Exactly, yeah. exactly. You were you were captured soon after that, um, in, in the war, and you were captured with an Austrian officer. <laughs> yeah. And this this antagonism between Germans and Austrians, you know, mm -hmm. in, in America we don't really know the difference. They yeah. sound exactly the same, you know, on and on. But there's that antagonism there, and somehow that antagonism came up when yeah, you guys right. were captured. So, well, after all the troops, uh, all my men were gone after that battle, uh, then in the forest near Alsenau, Alsenau, which I had taken before. And that is also something which I remember uh, as, as something positive. So um, somehow the area had been conquered already and uh, the f white flags were hanging from the church towers. So, but in the evening the Germans made a counterattack and so the flags were then taken down again. There was a signal, you know, the war has started. The German population was very upset about the whole thing. They thought peace was there. And so when I went somewhere, they gave me scrambled eggs there, but they said, go as fast as possible. And I slept in another farmer's bed for three hours and then he begged me to go. So they loved us because we were their sons, but they hated us because we brought the war back again. So. Nevertheless, I moved at evening into Alsenau and the uh, pattern had to run so fast that he left his hospital in the basement of the mayor's office there. And uh, so in there, there were Germans and there were Americans and they were treated equally according to the Geneva Convention. The convention holds, you know, what can be more hopeful than, than people sometimes are. So, um, and, and he had treated the Germans like he had treated the Americans, and so we did. And the Americans were the prisoners, the others were free, but they were still uh, wounded and got the same medicine and the same darkness and so on. So, so that, um, you know, there's something very important to see in that desperate situation, that there are really signs of hope that gas was never used in spite of the fact that everybody had it. There was an agreement on gas and it was not used. So. One can make treaties and treaties hold, and if it was only because of retaliation, you know, that may be, it may not be too noble a moral motivation, but you're afraid the other will do the same. So Churchill was tempted when Werner von Braun, the uh, SS colonel who got us to the moon, when he sent all these rockets to, uh, to London, then Churchill wanted to put gas into the bombs. He wanted to gas the German territory and the Admiralty told him, you know, the Germans will put the gas into the rockets and then you will be poisoned and, and so he did not, it was never done. So after Dresden, Hitler wanted to shoot all American pilots in the things. He said they have broken all rules of the Geneva Convention. But Dresden was bombed four times by hundreds of bombers, uh, British and then Americans in the morning. And uh, so it was so devastating that he thought, you know, all rules had been broken and he gave orders to uh, shoot all the American pilots and British pilots in his place. There were thousands of them in there. And the German generals were able to persuade him that the Americans and British would do this and the Canadians would do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So um, that, uh, yeah, that was the, uh, so the, the positive thing is that uh, uh, some rules to hold, as animalistic as these wars are, and as cruel and brutal and fanatic and so on. I think the American, the German people, soldiers, never hated Americans or Canadians or British. They may have hated French out of some strange reason, and <laughs> they hated Russians, you know. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, ten thousands of German soldiers moved from the east to the west in order to be taken prisoner by uh, right. Americans. They would rather be taken prisoner by Americans, and Goebbels Canadians. Was very upset about that, you know. Um, so, yes. I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of the Nazi brass were in the hands of the, the Americans and the British, yeah. as opposed to the Soviets. So right. when they were put yeah. on trial in the Nuremberg, 
you know, it, it was, the, the, of course, the Soviets once wanted to show that they're guilty and they could execute them, and yeah. the Americans, the British, the French right. said, no, we have to have a, a fair trial. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and so knowing that, the Nazi yeah. brass would rather yeah. have gone to the, to the Allied forces right. in the yeah. West. So when, when were you captured? Well, that was uh, after Easter, so Easter Monday or so, uh, in, in Alsenau, so in the forest there, after this battle. And uh, so the last thing, maybe we should uh, mention that very shortly, uh, the uh, very tragic type of a thing, which shows the senselessness, why so many soldiers come home and are nihilists, really. Um, so the, after that battle there, the American troops uh, followed us, the tanks followed us, and so we put trees down so that they slowed them down. But while they were slowed down, we were in, a, in an inn, in a little uh, restaurant, and uh, we celebrated the uh, birthday of the innkeeper's daughter. She was 18 years old. And so we had champagne, you know, in the middle of the war, and uh, the tanks are coming, you know, and the general said, you know, pose it to, you know, and uh, happy birthday, and we sang happy birthday, and so on. And then, you know, the first uh, gun, gun came, bullets came through the window, and so he said, well, now we want to show the Americans the last time German strategy. It was really German tactics, but he wanted to show German strategy. And so he took about 400 men, led them behind the mountain to the same street, maybe two miles up the road, and put them there on, on a hill. And so the tanks came, they came to the restaurant, there was a bunker, they uh, f f put flamethrowers on the bunker and fight the people if they're like chickens, which happens in war. So that was, this was not even a war crime. Um, so, and then they marched up there, you know, on, with the tanks and the infantry on the right and the left and had their guns on their shoulder and cigarette in the mouth and at five o'clock the next village, you know, where they could rest and uh, uh, see some four lines and have some coffee and whatever. And, uh, and then there was turmoil in the next village because the enemy was coming and they were particularly afraid of the black soldiers who were the best, who gave them all the chocolate and so So there is this war psychology which makes strange realities for people. Nevertheless, he put these people on that hill and so uh, then suddenly gave order to shoot and it was maybe one, two minutes only. So. And they were only uh, guns and machine guns and no heavy weapons or whatever. And then he stopped and told them all to withdraw. And what he wanted to show was that he knew what the barrels, uh, the degree to which the barrels of the tanks could go up. And it couldn't go up high enough, so they shut into that hill now all the time and didn't, uh, didn't hit anybody. The American tanks did. American tanks did, yeah. So Then eight years later, I went with my American wife, the Amari, I went to that restaurant, eight years only later, and uh, of course he couldn't recognize me anymore in uniforms and so on, people looked different. And so I said, uh, do you remember your daughter's uh, birthday, the, the 18th birthday? Yeah, of course I remember. And, so on. and the soldiers, yeah, he said, they were here all night long and shot all my cows, they thought they were tanks. And, so and then, yeah, they said, well, we also sang happy birthday. Yes, he said, and then I said, what happened then? Well, he said, well, then, the Americans came and then they marched on with the tanks and then <coughs> there was a horrible shooting, you know, and, uh, and then everything was quiet. And then I said, what happened then? Well, then came those bags, you know, in tents where they poured the fallen people down and they put them all up in his yard and uh, there were 92 of them. Mm. So there were 92 young people from Texas or Oklahoma or who did not really know where they were or why they were where they were and uh, who thought the war had been was over and they were only on a mopping up uh, ex, uh, ex, uh, um, program there. So nothing serious. The real troops were already in Würzburg and Bamberg and on the way to Berlin where they never arrived. But they went south then. Uh, so the war was really over, and there, this unbelievable casualties, these casualties, and so on. So nothing has ever been for me so as a symbol of, of the insanity of war, and therefore, and the critical theory has of religion has this anti-war component in itself. Right.
Well, that seems like a uh, pretty good place to take a break here, guys. Uh, about 45 minutes, and uh, I think uh, this is some wonderful, wonderful material. So what I do want to tell everybody for the podcast that we're doing, go ahead and look for part two. This is part one. There's going to be more parts coming with uh, Rudolph J. Siebert and Dustin John Bird. Dustin J. Bird, I guess I'm not used to calling him that, being that he's my brother and all. So, well, we'll be back, and I look for a part two coming up on the podcast with uh, Rudy J. Siebert. Awesome man. He's got so much good stuff to tell. I'd like to welcome everybody back for our second part of our podcast with Rudolph J. Siebert. And this is one probably one of the easiest podcasts I've ever get to do. I get to throw it over to my brother, Dustin, and he's asking the questions and talking to Rudy and bringing him through the process. So I'm going to do that right now. Back to you, Dustin, and I'm going to sit back and listen. Oh, thank you. Glad to be back. Uh, Rudy, when we left off talking about the Battle of Aschaffenburg, mm-hmm. um, and you were captured uh, soon after that, um, describe your experience in being captured. What happened to you? Where did you go? Yeah, so it was uh, on Easter Monday. Um, and it was after the battle on the Hahn camp, so that I then uh, had no troops left, whatever, so I had to surrender. And I did this with a sergeant, with an Austrian sergeant, so every officer had a sergeant with him. And so we surrendered to the uh, American officers and Canadian officers. And uh, then suddenly the sergeant pulled a little Austrian flag out of his uniform and said he had never been in the German army, he was always in the Austrian army, and so all the officers laughed around it. It was a very hilarious situation, and um, if I had a gun still, I would probably have shot him, but he said he had never been in the German army. There there was no Austrian army for eight years or so, so um, that was a hilarious moment. So, And then I was um, put into a basement as a prisoner of war in the basement, and it was full of uh, uh, glasses with uh, food in it, which the family uh, had uh, done for um, for the winter to have something to eat during the winter, and so um, I was hungry somewhat. But in my conscience, I remember, and people laugh about this when I tell them. In my Catholic conscience, I thought I could not eat this from them because it was theirs, and so I got went on starving and. I regretted that deeply when I was then in Worms in the uh, prison camp with about 20,000 or so prisoners and for a week we didn't get anything to eat so that was then uh, I thought it would have been better to eat those uh, pears or whatever was in those glasses. So um, my Catholic education went with me into the battle. Hmm. And um, you were in quite a few different uh, camps before you made yeah. it to Camp So Edward, I was brought from Alsenau then to Worms, where this huge camp was, and that people were starving was not the fault of the American army or whatever. It was just a um, problem of transportation. They had millions of American soldiers, and then all the prisoners coming in, they could not possibly handle it. So... Um, so therefore, I never complained about it in terms of the Geneva Convention or whatever. From there, I was brought to Elsass Lorraine in a train, an animal t- train, and uh, there I was stoned by the Elsass Lorraine people because they wanted to show that they were now good German citizens again. They were always French and then German, French and German. Now they were German again, uh, French again, and so I became unconscious and. Uh, one of my comrades, a Protestant minister, gave me the last uh, water he had, and that made me into a ecumenist from this time on. And uh, that was a component of our critical theory later on, that it was very ecumenical. Hmm. And then from there, to um, I went to Marseille, and there was a huge prisoner of war camp. And uh, there I was uh, several weeks, and. Uh, there was the custom that the uh, almost hundred men were led out to the beach and then they collected uh, pebbles and put, made little heaps. And uh, so one day I thought it would be a good idea to join them. So I was the last of the hundred and we marched to the beach, but we didn't stay at the beach. We went on and on and on and were brought to a ship. And the ship went to Oran and we thought we would have to, uh, um, you know, work on roads or whatever. 
but in Oran we were put together with other ships and then we were, went through Gibraltar and, and to Norfolk was one of the last the war was still going on. So on the way then we met with German U-boats, the telescopes were looking out or whatever periscopes, periscopes were looking out of the water, two of them and uh, so the American captain put all the prisoners along the railings of the ship in the hope that the uh, U-boat commander would not uh, shoot. We underestimated, of course, the <laughs> German U-boat commanders. He would hardly have hesitated to shoot, but they were on their way to Brazil or to Argentine to their fascist friends there, probably with personnel, fascist personnel and money and gold and so on. So they were not in, uh, in interested in engagement anymore. Mm. So from the Anson's Lorraine to Marseille, yeah. in, in France, and to, to Iran, Iran, Algeria, and then to Norfolk. And then in Norfolk. Yeah, and there I saw the first time the Chesapeake Bay, a, a lightened city. So I had never seen a city with the lights on before uh, 1939. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a tremendous experience and the press was there. And they put me together with an older man who was 70 years old and I was 17. And he said, this is Hitler's army now, this is where he has come down to finally. Right. And then I was brought into the camp and uh, in the camp there was um, the officer there from Stauffenberg, a, 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 a cousin of the one who had tried to assassinate Hitler. And he stood in the door and said, you know, we were in our rags and I had only an undershirt on there and uh, nothing else. I left everything in the camp there in, in Marseille, whatever I had. So, And so he said, why didn't you fight better? And said, why, why didn't you fight better? So this was all the Africa Corps, which was there. And they had been treated very well and uh, um, they, um, you know, remained Nazis. They, didn't believe us that the cities were bombed out, that was all uh, enemy propaganda and so on. So it was quite uh, an enlightenment which we brought to them. And in the first night, they uh, sentenced somebody to death still in the name of Hitler uh, because he had talked with a, a Jewish uh, sergeant, a Secret Service sergeant, and that was a crime. And they put his head into the toilet and killed him. <coughs> and so the military police came in. But um, nobody d told anything what hap happened. Every silence is all stuck together mm -hmm. um, in their Nazi spirit. Mm. Right, so you, you got to work while you were in the, the camp. Yeah. Well, I was an officer, so officers didn't uh, have to work. But I uh, wanted to have to do something. So I uh, worked in the harbor in Norfolk and uh, drove a little truck. And uh, I... Um, pushed uh, boxes and whenever a box fell down that belonged to the prisoners so every tenth box then fell down and uh, the prisoners got the clothing from it and so on and then because it didn't work with me there were the boxes I then did hamburgers in a, in a restaurant the harbor for the GIs and their girlfriends and so on and there I let every tenth hamburger disappear in my big trousers there and uh, we took them home to feed, but when they found out about that, I was fired from this job too. <laughs> then there was a wonderful Jewish sergeant who took me into the library, the camp library, so I became a librarian. <laughs> that was better than I, I did better there, right? The library, yeah. But the main thing in these camps was now that there were hearings, cross hearings, and no torture whatsoever. But in these hearings, then people were found out where they were stationed, what they did. So I had comrades who, one comrade who um, had been a truck driver in Poland and uh, so they saw the unit with which he was, what he did, what did you have on the trucks and so and so and so, until it came out that he drove the truck with people to a quarry where they were killed and then he was categorized as a war criminal or others were categorized as Nazis, and maybe they confessed themselves, and then others uh, said that they were in opposition. And so with me, they asked me about the Pope and what happened in Frankfurt, and some of these uh, Jewish agents were from Frankfurt. They spoke better German than I did and knew more about it, and so they knew what the Catholic Youth Movement had done there. And so I was categorized then as anti-Nazi. Then I was trained by 
people, um, professors from different universities, uh, against the background and that insight, which came from the Frankfurt School and the New School in New York, that uh, not all Germans were, uh, were Nazis. And Morgenthau, a uh, member of the cabinet of Roosevelt, had that idea that all were Nazis and that one should castrate them all and one should make it Germany into an agricultural country without any industry whatsoever. So that was pushed aside and that is how this program was established. And so the first time that I came in contact with the Frankfurt School people's thinking and acting was in that camp in Norfolk. Mm. You could say that our critical theory of religion started in that camp or afterwards. Right. right. And a lot of those critical theorists were in America because they, they were, were exiles. They were all, yeah, most of yeah. them. So, uh, of course, uh, Benjamin never made it. You know, he uh, committed suicide in Port Boo, but he was on his way to that institute at Columbia University. At Columbia University, a very conservative uh, president, had given them a whole house for their work in which they stayed during the war. And that was Theodore Adorno, Max Horkheimer, yeah, and, and Marcuse, and, Marcuse. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and Marcuse actually worked for the OSS, right? Which yeah, was they the, were then hired, you know, in the different departments of the uh, State Department and uh, worked even up to the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. had these positions. Yeah. Right, because they understood uh, the fascists very well, they understood Germany yeah, very well, right, the fascists yeah. and well, the German They were mind. specialists particularly for Russia, also mm -hmm. for Communism, they knew what communism was and what socialism was, and uh, so that's why they were very valuable. Right, right. Yeah. And then, um, so you came into contact with the Frankfurt School and with Critical yeah. Theory in, in Camp Allen uh, in Virginia, uh, and you were educated to, to go back to Germany and help democratize right, yeah, Germany. Yeah. Um, you know, and you went back and you, you, you did that, and you also went to school. Yeah. Um, and I remember you telling a story one time about, um, I think it was a professor of yours who told you to read Goethe. Yeah, right. Well, before that happened, the little accident happened, um, they put, uh, the, they were all, the prisoners were put on liberty ships, and the Nazis were supposed to go to Bolbeck and whatever, and the anti-Nazis to Hamburg. But they mixed up a ship which had only numbers and in the State Department, and so I, my all with me people there, 250 or so, we were all sent to Le Havre and then to Bolbeck, and there was a camp for SS men, <coughs> which looked very much like, an, uh, like a concentration camp. <coughs> so when we came in there, the officer played with his dog. He behaved like, like an SS man, and he took um, all the cigarettes out of our sea bags and uh, all the chocolate, which we were supposed to use in Frankfurt in the railroad station, the black market, because you have to eat before you have democracy. <coughs> and so we had nothing anymore. We said, you know, we are anti-Nazis, we have that mission, and so I said, all Germans are anti-Nazis, and so on. So and I came into the tent, and there were people laying there dead, two of them were dead in the water, and the comrades did not give uh, uh, tell that to the commander because they um, wanted to get the food stamps, uh, the food for them. And so French... Uh, um, Doctors came in and they wanted to have, we were well fed, wanted us to work in the mines, coal mines, or to work in the minefields and pick up the mines where the maps were lost and so then you lost your arm or your leg and that was against the Geneva Convention. Right. Um, so and I, when I came to the military government in Frankfurt and I talked about this and there have been written books about this. So prisoners mm -hmm. were used in these dangerous uh, capacities, and that was um, was not according to the law. Right, and this is after you were declared an anti-Nazi in yeah, the U.S., right, and you were yeah. sent back to democratize right, Germany, right, yeah, yeah. but because of some paperwork... Yes, yeah, so after three weeks, they discovered it in Washington, uh, and then weeks. we were uh, sent home then. Yeah. Right, right. And so you returned back to Frankfurt. Right, to Heilbronn. I was released in Heilbronn, and uh, then uh, to Frankfurt, and I went to the IG Farben building, which was now the military government building mm -hmm. for the for the American zone. For the American zone, which yeah. they never bombed out, the IG Farben building yeah. in Frankfurt. Yeah, there were several things which they didn't bomb out, and that was one building, and uh, also their, their factories in Höchst, outside of Frankfurt, were never mm -hmm. bombed. So, um, yeah, that was... Uh, uh, and then also the railroad station was never bombed itself, 
And then there was a hotel, a famous hotel in Frankfurt, where they, the officers wanted to live, Frankfurter Hof, and they never bombed that yeah, neither. So well, when it you was go to, all pre, pre-planned. Yeah, yeah, when you go to Frankfurt today, it's such a modern city, and then that's a testament yeah, to how right. much of it was bombed out. Yeah. And then afterwards, they decided to build modern. Right, yeah. Um, so 80% were bombed out. Right. And the Institute for Social Research, the Frankfurt School, was bombed out. Too in the last right. February 1945. That's right. But then the city of Frankfurt paid for it again, and uh, and also the American army paid for it, mm-hmm. that it would be rebuilt. Now, did you have to finish high school? Yeah, well, I had to finish the gymnasium, the abitur. Uh-huh. Um, and so all the other people came back from the Eastern Front, the Western Front camp, you know, and uh, so we did our Latin, we had to learn, relearn our Latin and our mathematics and so on. And I think they let us go through a little bit more easier. There was one mathematics professor, I was never good in mathematics, but I went through and I think it's still a miracle, but he had a son who was our age and he had been killed by the Russians at the Eastern Front. And uh, so he saw his son in all of us. And I think he treated us like his son. Right. Right. So, um, and then there were people, of course, with high moral standards uh, Schumann, Professor Schumann, and I was his class speaker or class leader, and so um, and he came and said they have cheated me again and so on and so on in their Latin test or whatever. And I said, well, I'm also for the law, but you have to think where these people are coming from and what they went through, and so mm-hmm. I tried to, you know, make him understand the situation. And what was it like in Germany at that time? Were, were people just they didn't want to talk about the war, it was just rebuild and let's move on? Or they yeah. were still reflecting on what happened? Well, I mean, 80% was you know, the ruins everywhere. See, mm-hmm. It's just a horrible situation, no food, you know, food stamps and very little and so on. So people demoralized, many were believers, you know, they were now disappointed and Hitler didn't use miracle weapons or whatever. But nobody hated him now for it or what, it was a very strange type of a thing. And um, later on, my cousin became the judge for Auschwitz, Auschwitz trial. He got gray hairs not only because uh, of what had happened in Auschwitz, but also because the Germans hit at him all the time because he sentenced, you know, his own countrymen uh, for the foreigners and, and so on. So, so therefore, you know, the Germans then tried very hard to become members of the Western community again, and the Marshall Plan was an ingenious start. In the end of the Roosevelt administration, General Marshall really governed the country, and his idea of this Marshall Plan, which was also offered to East Germany and to Russia, um, was, an, uh, from the Western point of view, was a very humane thing and uh, very productive. Mm-hmm. So the Germans then rebuilt, and their whole energy went into this rebuilding of the city and the economy, and many of the fascists came back, of course. So Erhard, for instance, Hitler had given um, uh, Erhard, the, uh, uh, had made him the head of a committee which was supposed to do a, a currency reform, 1 to 10, which left the class system intact. And so the same Erhard then did that same thing which Hitler had ordered after Hitler was dead mm-hmm. in the German Republic, Federal Republic. Mm-hmm. And it was carried out, and then he became the economics minister, and he became finally chancellor after after Adenauer. So, right. so because I discussed that with my cousin recently, and said we had another plan to reconstruct Germany, not to rebuild what had happened before, and out of which the Weimar regime came fascism in the first place. If we just rebuild it again, fascism will come again. And Hitler had predicted it would come 100 or 200 years later. Well, it came 70 years later. So mm-hmm. um, that was, um, you know, that was. And my cousin, as I discussed it with him, who came more from the fascist side, he said that there was little choice at that time. And he's right, but the German people had the choice to build another system. And that's what I did with Dirks and Kogon when we built this Christian Democratic Party in which we want to have Christians and workers together in order to do something about the class situation. But it all went the other way and the Christian Democratic Party, I remained in it after Adenauer took over. I was on the left wing who made all these social laws, so 
Um, but then came the neoliberal counter-revolution and many of these laws were cancelled, but it's still a very good uh, social system. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not um, just a liberal state, it is also a social state, right. the German federal uh, government. So, and Merkel, of course, has done a good job in the sense of Adenauer, not in the sense of Kogon and Dix, right. and uh, what we try to do. So, uh, when you got back, when, where did you go to school? What did you study? Well, then I went to Frankfurt and I studied with the Frankfurt people and uh, other professors who were anti-Nazis in the University of Frankfurt, University of Mainz, University of Münster, and then Catholic University here in, in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. So you did your master's here in Washington, D.C., right? Well, I got a master's in Washington, D.C., but I did all the other degrees. In Germany. State examen and everything in, yeah. in Germany, yeah. And uh, you met your wife. Wow. Yeah, during the time when I studied in so social work leadership, mm -hmm. leadership program, uh, in order to perfect what I had learned before, and that's where we met. Yeah, we mm -hmm. met uh, Maggie uh, Noyes, who was also she was in um, social work as well. Mm -hmm. And she was from a, a German background too. Yeah, from a German mm -hmm. uh, family who had. Uh, and I wrote later on. I wrote about her family. Uh, and uh, so, oh, yeah, okay. And so, I wrote her about her family background and uh, how she did. Very, her father had died before uh, her birth, um, and that went back to 1917, 18, when he was a soldier in the American army and studied uh, elect uh, electrical engineering at Catholic University and had to help in the hospitals because at that time there was a horrible flu epidemic and thousands of people died and so the army had to help and so he overworked himself and had a heart attack when he was 18 mm. in the 19 in the uh, basement of the elect uh, electrical engineering building. Yeah. So and then after you did your studies here you went back to Germany and your wife went with you. And uh, were your children? No, no I, no, I went back then because that was the obligation, you know, mm -hmm. you had your training and then you went back and I followed this and uh, then uh, two or three years later, then we got, uh, two years later we got engaged in the cathedral in St. Gallen in Switzerland and mm -hmm. then uh, th three years later we got the Bishop of Mainz then uh, married us, as we say. I see. Yeah. And so how many of your children were born in Germany? Four of them were born, Four. yeah. And Germany is, of course, easier with the child uh, family wages and uh, then also what you get. If you have four children, you don't have to work anymore. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's the same thing in France and also in Eastern Europe and so on. So it became harder than when we came over here to right. Baltimore. And uh, um, yeah, the reason now why we came was that uh, because the Frankfurt School had predicted that there would be some kind of a populism, an authoritarian populism again, uh, fascism again, or Trumpism. They did not predict Trump, but they predict Trumpism. And uh, so out of this, uh, I thought that it would be much more dangerous if this whole thing which had happened in Europe, if that would happen over here. And uh, so that's how we came over here, and uh, I worked, uh, taught with the Jesuits first in Baltimore, and through the Jesuits then I came here to Western, to the religion department, where I have been for 54 years. And that was in 1965? Yeah, 1965, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, it was always the case that the Frankfurt School was, was really worried uh, about the potential for fascism in the United States, and of yeah. course, in their 1950 book, the Authoritarian Personality, they spell that out very clearly yeah. that it's, it's the, the whole tendencies for fascism are just right. just under the yeah. surface there. Yeah, right. And so, so uh, they were afraid uh, already when they were here, you know, during the war. <clears throat> there were people who wanted to uh, send all the Jews to Alaska, like Hitler wanted to send to Madagascar, uh, but that was under British control, so he couldn't do it. But they made tests at that time, I mean real scientific tests, you could say they sent a ship over to Havana full of Jews in order to prove to the whole world that the whole world hated the Jews, mm -hmm. that nobody wanted them. So they came to Havana <coughs> and the ship was rejected, it was under our, our, our control at right. that time, right. and the ship was uh, rejected, they could not disembark, 
And um, then the captain, the old German captain from the old uh, Marines, uh, Navy of the F First World War, he went up the coast to New York and he was rejected too. He got coal, you know, for his uh, energy and uh, food and so on, but nobody could disembark all of Majesty. And though Hitler said, see, nobody wanted them, we are not alone, and so on. So, and then the cha captain, who had some sense of honor, he took them back then, but um, he knew what would happen to them if he would land in Hamburg. So he uh, crashed his ship at the coast, very close to the British uh, uh, island. And uh, so they were all rescued and were put into internment camps. And then they were sent back to Holland and Belgium, and there the troops, German troops, came right. and uh, later on and conquered this territory and mm -hmm. took them all into concentration camps. Yeah. So after you finished your studies in Germany, you came back to the U.S. Right, yeah. And you were teaching in Baltimore. Right. So were the Mary Knoll sisters that was? No, that was later. Okay. Later on, I taught every summer with the Mary Knoll sisters and priests. And uh, the reason for that was the sisters went into uh, uh, Central America, uh, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and so on. And there they would meet with socialists the first time. We have no Labour Party here, we have no socialism here in the public sphere, really. And so they were, I told them all what they would be like so that they could talk with them and so on. And then we found out when they came back and told their father, mother, relatives what they had experienced, nobody believed them. And uh, so then they left. The order wanted them to stay with the family, you know, a few weeks, but they left after a few days. They couldn't talk with their relatives, they didn't understand what they were talking about. And so that's these two things I had to do to explain it then, how they could talk with their parents, who were not only not knowing what socialism is, but hated it even, mm -hmm. and uh, were anti-socialist, anti anti-communist, and so on. Mm -hmm. So, and then two, f two of my students were killed in uh, El Salvador. They were together, four, four nuns and one girl who was engaged with the Dutchman, and they were, they were all, uh, the uh, sisters were raped and robbed and then killed. And it was the American ambassador White who forced the government to, to uh, undig the, to take them out of their graves again. And so the whole thing became known. And he was fired very soon. He was a good friend of mine. He came here to campus sometimes. So uh, that, uh, that was Mary no, that was later known there. I taught theology and I taught economics, and I also wanted to ta uh, teach the uh, social and circular letters uh, of the Roman Catholic Church, which since um, 1889 or so had encyclical letters about capitalism and what Catholics should do about capitalism. It was some kind of teaching which you can call solidarism, and it was between liberalism on one side and socialism on the other side. And so I wanted to teach that. The Jesuits said, you cannot teach that. You will lose all your friends. I said, well, <laughs> let's try. <laughs> so I taught it anyway. I didn't lose my friends, but it was not very popular. Right. So Catholics, when they came here, the Irish or so, they were not educated enough. So they couldn't read it. And later on, they made it into the middle class, like the Kennedys, and they didn't want to read it anymore. So the social and circulators have a strange fate uh, in this country. Right. Yeah. But so did others. So, for instance, Tillich wrote this, uh, the Socialist Decision in 1933 in Sitz Marie in the Alps, uh, where Nietzsche wrote Zarathustra. And uh, then the German government, the fascist government, said, you know, rescind that book and we give you the best position uh, in, the, in, the, in the universities. And he just laughed in the cultural minister's face and uh, went with Horkheimer, with the, with the Jews, into exile. Right. Right. All was frightened here that he would be poor as a professor and wouldn't have anything in his old age. But somebody took care of him in the end and paid something for him so hmm. that he ended up teaching in the Chicago University right. and had some jobs there. So, so that, uh, no, that went well, this and uh, so there was Father Harden here. He was a Jesuit. He taught here and uh, he had a lot of students and he wanted to have somebody who would do the same thing. And so Weston hired me really to teach Catholic theology. And that was a very strange situation because under the Constitution, 
strictly, you cannot have theology. The Constitution is agnostic, and uh, so theology means that you know something about God, so you cannot possibly have theology in American universities. But the strange thing is that there are some socialistic states, Slovenia, for instance, which are under socialism, but they do have theology in their universities. Sometimes it looks, you know, that the bourgeois revolution was more um, anti-religious than the socialists was, but that's not true all the time. So, nevertheless, I, that's why I was hired here. There was uh, the president Miller and, and the Conley Low and uh, Vice President Seibert. Uh, they were all Presbyterians and they wanted to have a theology. They don't understand how it worked, but uh, that's how it started out. So to have a rabbi to teach and to have Protestant ministers and then to a Catholic to do, or to to teach too. So, mm -hmm. but later on the theology department was changed into a. A, a science of religion department, Religionswissenschaft, and that is what it is today. Right, the comparative Compar religion. It's department. called comparative yeah, religion at, at yes, Western right, Michigan yes. University. But yeah. that excludes uh, theology. And sometimes, and, and I feel sorry about that, that sometimes it became anti theological. There's no reason for that because there are great theologians like Niebuhr and Tillich and Barth and, and so on. So they, um, one should take that very seriously. Mm -hmm. So in the framework, you know, of the science of religion, I also then did teach about liberation theology and, and so on. So one can do that, you know, legally. Yeah. Yeah, so you came to Western in 1965, which was right in the middle of really the Third Youth Movement. Yeah. Uh, this, this massive change, you know, that was going on. And Western was a part of that. I mean, yeah. even Dr. Oh, yeah. King came to, to Western to give yeah. a speech, yeah. and Malcolm X, for instance, came to Michigan State yeah. to give speeches. Uh, and the students in, in, in Western Michigan were very much a part of, of that movement. Yeah. Um, and you came in right at that time, right. in yeah. 1965. What it was, was it, it like? It was a campus? good time to come. So many of these students were uh, influenced from Tokyo through this country to Italy, were uh, influenced by the Frankfurt School. They split later on because they thought the Frankfurt School was not uh, revolutionary enough and so on, but they were still, and they were also Bakuninists, they were anarchists, and uh, we had it all here on the campus, you know. I remember a very sad moment where I stood with uh, Vice President uh, Seibert, and the students took the flag down, you know. And then the flag was laying down in the, in the mud, and uh, even the students were not happy about it, you know, and were suddenly shocked by what they themselves had done. The university was very tolerant. I, I was the in-between man between that movement, the student movement, and the universities here in, in Ann Arbor. And I tried to mediate between the two sides and make it understandable what was happening, because many people here were such, just shocked and did not know exactly what was happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, the majority of professors were very upset about the whole thing. There was a breakdown of discipline in the classroom, the cafeteria was taken over, buses were turned upside down. and uh, But I gave many speeches and I had always, uh, you know, I could I could talk to them. You know. I went over in our slum area there, north side, and I talked to people there. I was always protected by the Sutton family. It was a black family who were always protecting me from all sides and so I could talk there too, and that was, um, and I made this experience then later on when I went to Yugoslavia, and which was communist still at that time, or when I taught in the, the um, German Republic, Democratic Republic, which was also st Stalinistic even, I uh, I never had any problems <laughs> in a certain sense, and in spite of my German background, people had all the good reasons, you know. Mm -hmm. to hate me for my German background, but it was not brought up. And in the communist areas, I think it was that they were so fascinated by German culture, by Beethoven and Mozart and Goethe and Schiller and so on, that they somehow forgot or forgave what the German society and the German state and the German military had done to them. In Yugoslavia, close to Dubrovnik, where I founded that course there, 
um, Germans uh, who had been attacked by partisans, you know, the trains had been attacked, and then would go into a town and shoot the whole high school with teachers and students. Horrible, brutal, terrible things have happened. And uh, one should have thought, you know, that people would be upset about this, and they certainly were, but they never let me feel anything personally. And the same thing was in uh, Yalta, where the uh, horrible battles took place, you know, in, in the area, and uh, the whole Nepa River was full of blood on the way to Stalingrad and so on. So it is unbelievable what these people went through, but there was always a strange and uh, sort of mild or whatever tolerance for me as a person, be it now as an ex-German or as an American. Mm -hmm. And so we had to stop that in Yalta only because of the sanctions which had been imposed by the Obama. Yeah. And unjustified because uh, uh, Crimea has never been occupied or annexed or whatever. Uh, all the people, you know, the universities who invite us and so on, none of them has been... There was a referendum in which the people decided to join the uh, uh, Federation, you know, the Russian mm -hmm. Federation. So, and, and the Ukraine thing was that um, somehow the Russians wanted to uh, put a stop to the expansion of NATO, which is all around already and uh, wanted to penetrate uh, the Ukraine too. So then the conflict between Russia and the Ukraine came about. But uh, so one has to look at this, and I am in contact with people in St. Petersburg and in Moscow and so on. And um, it is part of our critical theory for religion to build, uh, to promote the cooperation between the Slavic world and the American world, because they are the only ones who can kill each other in a few hours. So we must pay uh, the greatest attention to that relationship and not uh, promote any kind of a hysteria or osophobia, which uh, American professors have studied around here, and I just put it all together in my new book there. So we cannot afford such a hysteria. It's simply too dangerous. Mm -hmm. The Russians, as I experienced them in 20 years or so, are very very friendly and people and very emotional and they love you and they uh, you know do everything for you but what they possibly can but if you give them reason you know to distrust or whatever it all turns around and the Germans have experienced that you know in the battle in Stalingrad where 10 million people were fighting against each other in one city and then in of course in uh, starting quite in the decisive battle, then in course a tank battle, where the uh, so the Germans at least should never forget this, and it's somewhat strange that the Westerners always are afraid of Eastern attacks or whatever. If one thinks that the Russians, you know, were responsible, that Asian forces like Attila or Chinggis Khan were only two and not more, you know, they protected Europe and made it possible. And on the other hand, the already uh, the Crusaders went to into marched into Russia and killed people, and then Napoleon with eight hundred thousand men and Hitler with four million men and so on, and all that was done to them. And we always have that feeling that they want to do something bad against right. us. You know. Speaking of hysteria, um, again back in the nineteen sixties when you came here, you came in the midst of of the Vietnam mm -hmm. War. Uh, my father was in Vietnam mm -hmm. and. and 1968, he was there during the Tet Offensive. Um, he was drafted, like so many other mm -hmm. young men were drafted. But that, of course, sparked a lot of backlash. At home, young people didn't want to go. They didn't want to fight in that war. Mm -hmm. They thought it was unjust. Uh, and you were part of that anti-war yeah, movement right, here in the yeah. 1960s, and you gave lots of speeches. Right. Yeah, so tell me about that. What, how, I, how even, I even have a police file, so where they uh, always wrote down when I make speeches. Only when I flew somewhere, they didn't have enough money, I think, to follow or something. And then I also had students, and I told them, you know, they could make some money by, by being informers, and they did. They made some money. So, so they took notes yeah. in your class of what they you did, said? They yeah, and, and gave it to them, yes. Right. And I don't think they understood anything. And also, the judges behaved very well. So I did have the uh, Secret Service you know, in front of the house, and they watched the house for weeks and weeks. 
But the judges always said they have to come to us before they want to do anything, and then we will give them instruction and so on. And so it was. Democracy held up in mm -hmm. the whole thing. So I had even had a Secret Service guy living on the same street, and he watched all the time. <laughs> and so they sometimes came into the house in order to catch a student. If they would have caught him in the forest behind the house, and he would have a shirt, which I would have given him, then I would have had five years imprisonment, a hundred thousand dollars on top of it, punishment or money or whatever. So, so that, for assisting a draft dodger. <laughs> right, yeah, they went to Canada, they went to Cuba and, uh, and so on, and that was a traitorous act or so. so. But sometimes the, the policemen came back from the forest and hadn't caught, caught anybody, and they were out of breath, you know, and I said, well, why don't you concentrate on the mafia downtown? who meet here between Chicago and Detroit all the time. That, that keeps you busy and they cannot breathe very well neither. So, um, but they tried it anyway. I said, you have to understand this whole movement, where it comes from and so on. <laughs> so, yeah, but one case I will never forget. There was a student in my class who was the son, a middle class son, here from Kalamazoo. I don't want to mention the name. And uh, so he was in my class and then he went to Georgetown University. Catholic families sent their children any, to uh, Georgetown or to um, our Catholic university here close by. And uh, so um, then he left and went to Georgetown. And after a year he came back and he had become a communist. So I said, how can you become a communist at Georgetown University, not the Jesuit University? Well, he had become a communist. So then they wanted to draft him. So I wrote a letter to him, to the draft board, and I said, he. Uh, you know, he is a Catholic, and uh, he, uh, uh, as a Catholic and a Christian, there are a lot of Catholics and Christians in Vietnam. The, the dictator himself was a Catholic, um, who was assassinated then. So, uh, and then he cannot kill Christians, so, so that is not possible. Then he has become a communist, and therefore there are a lot of communists in Vietnam, and of course he cannot, cannot kill communists either. And then I said, he thinks he can be, be a Catholic and a communist. He must be nuts. And I said, the army has so many already, so don't do it, don't draft him. And the answer came back next day. He <laughs> was free, he didn't have to, you know. A perfectly dialectical letter. Yes, right, it was very, very dialectical. So, but um, it was one of those regime change attempts, you know, of which we have made 25. The last one uh, didn't work in Syria. Uh, and it didn't work in the Crimea, in Crimea either, of course, so um, there was good reason to uh, think that this war was, it was not declared neither. None of these wars since 1945 was declared. Nobody said like Roosevelt, the uh, Japanese Empire, you know, has made a heinous attack on us. I asked Congress to declare war against the uh, Empire of Japan. That is, a, that is what the Constitution demands, mm -hmm. and it wasn't done at all. And so, so there were many problems with this, with this war. How <laughs> it started already, DM, you know, had studied here in Lansing and uh, was a Catholic dictator who did not respect the Buddhists very much and uh, then uh, could not hold the South. Yeah. And Ho Chi Minh himself was quite a liberal guy who was asking America for help to... Yeah, he said, go home, take off your uniform and come back as traders, you know. Yeah. There is this question which, I, which we had already at that time is, uh, you know, why not, uh, why do we have to own the Michelin rubber company like the French had before? Uh, why cannot, can we not trade with them or why can we not, uh, why do we have to own the, the coffee plantations in El Salvador? Why can't we trade? It. Why do we have to own the uh, oil refineries in, in, in uh, Iraq and, and so on? I mean, the El Salvador, the um, what other places. So, um, so that is was the general question behind the whole thing. So, and I thought that, uh, and many others, that the war was not justified by, for instance, the, the seven point just war theory of St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. uh, we looked at all seven points, and none of the points was uh, justified. Yeah. And uh, the Bush administration still followed the uh, seven point just war theory. So um, I don't know if it's cannot, if it can still be valid with atomic bombs and all this now the new technology. Mm -hmm. But 
it uh, was still accepted by, by all the governments involved. So um, that the one point was that you cannot uh, uh, kill civilians in the process, and there were many civilians killed in that process, that you must have a chance to win. There was never a chance to win, like in the Near East, neither. Um, or that it has to be declared by the right authority, which would mm -hmm. be Congress, and it wasn't. And it has to be proportional. And, yeah, uh, right, yeah, right. Well, all right, I think that's a good time to take a break. Yes, it is. It's a very good time to break. take a break at 45 minutes. This has been an absolute pleasure listening to this, guys. Um, you are certainly a living history, Rudy. And uh, not only that, you have so much uh, information to uh, give to us. Uh, and not just your autobiography and what you've been through, because I think as we keep going through this and we get through the autobiography, we're finally, we'll finally we get to the critical theory of religion, and then we'll really be talking about some stuff I don't understand. So uh, we'll be back on that, and uh, look for part three with uh, Rudy uh, uh, Rudolph J. Siebert and Dustin John Bird, my brother, uh, as moderator. So uh, we'll be back. Look for part three.